Okay, thank you everyone and welcome. Um, uh, I have the pleasure to now introduce Ian, Ian uh, Edlin from, from Clemson University. Um, he's now been visiting us for a couple of weeks, working on, uh, I would say, a rather complicated issue, which is going to be quite helpful for the work we're going to do or are doing in, in NCP, in the English Computational Toxicology Team. Um, and Ian is coming from, from Clemson University, where he's a PhD. He's working with pharma, uh, more pharmacogenetic approaches, which we will learn more about in the lecture. And we're trying to do now in, in the next upcoming, hopefully, months, would be to try to link that up to our work in, in the risk assessment database and how we are, are extrapolating from, from in vivo uh, to in vitro data and vice versa. And I assume you can give all the details for security. Right. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to read the title here. That's going to take most of my time. So I'll let, <laughs> let you read it and uh, continue on. So I work in... Uh, there we go. I work in computational toxicology, and from the EPA, this just says it's the application of uh, models and uh, biological approaches uh, to prioritize data requirements and risk assessments. So uh, this isn't replacing animal testing or, or anything like that. It's uh, it's hopefully uh, limiting some, some extraneous in vivo testing, but really helping us to concentrate our efforts on, on where the most critical research should be. And, and it's all about efficiency and most efficiently uh, being able to, uh, to, to do those types of assays. Um, so I uh, stole this graphic from Knut, but there's a, a variety of different types of models within uh, within computational toxicology. Today I'll be talking more about the uh, uh, models that lead from external to internal concentrations, the toxicokinetic or pharmacokinetic models, and then a little bit about uh, some of the adverse outcome pathway type modeling. So PBTK modeling physiologically based toxicokinetic or physiologically based pharmacokinetic, so toxico or pharmaco, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, we're essentially describing the ADME or absorption uh, into uh, a fish here, distribution throughout the body, which tissues it's going into, uh, where it's being metabolized and where it's being excreted. And uh, so physiologically based as opposed to as opposed to regression based modeling of course we're going to be using physiologically based parameters which will help us to uh, extrapolate across species so the general equations used in PBTK modeling um, actually aren't that bad if you if you look at the if you look at the individual equations it's all about mass balance distribution so if you look from the arterial blood we have a compound that's flowing through that blood into the various tissues and that's going to be mainly governed by the concentration in the arterial blood and q which is our blood flow into the specific tissues so that's going in and then leaving, going out. Now we have a partitioning coefficient of each of those tissues that uh, is going to govern how much leaves into the venous blood. Um, so that's the base of it. Then you have your exposure models. So this is uh, a gill exposure model. Um, and there's a few other models for uh, dietary exposure, dermal exposure, et cetera. Um, then, of course, you have to deal with some uh, biotransformation, so you can use first order or michaelis menten kinetics in metabolizing uh, compartments or metabolizing tissues. And, of course, then you need to parameterize this whole model in order for it to work. So what, what uh, considerations do we have? Like I just mentioned, parameterization, so that's uh, pretty critical. Um, some uh, parameters are easily measured. Uh, tissue volumes, et cetera. Other ones like uh, partitioning coefficients might be a little harder to determine. And, uh, and so maybe we have some uh, QSAR type models or in, in, uh, in vitro and vivo extrapolation to, to determine some of those other parameters. Um, once we come up with all these individual equations, then we have to group them together and solve them as an ordinary differential equation. And this is where it gets a little bit complex sometimes. You need to uh, understand how to use ODEs and, and how to simulate those ODEs using 
uh, software or special um, ODE tools. And then once you have created a model, how do we distribute it? Um, so a lot of times in literature, they'll describe how to uh, create a model and so forth, but then the audience is, uh, they need to know, understand how to solve ODEs and so forth in order to use that model. So it'd be nice if I could just send you a file and say, here, go play, uh, play with this model and see if we can simulate it. That's not always the case using ODEs. So my first objective is to make uh, PBTK modeling um, more accessible, easier to use. And um, so like I mentioned, there's uh, uh, a number of challenges about uh, using ODEs, distribution, and, and simulation. Um, but what I propose here is to use PetriNet modeling. What this is, is a, uh, a, a mathematical modeling tool which breaks up an ODE into its component parts. And essentially now you have a graphically based uh, solver of, of ordinary different uh, differential equations. There's only three uh, main types of objects used in Petri net modeling. You have a place, which is the circle. You have a transition, which is the square. And you have an uh, arc or an edge which is the arrow that's pointing from one direction to another. And uh, fairly simple rules, uh, a place is only connected to another place through a transition. So a place holds these tokens or those little red things that are going around and the transition governs the flow. So uh, any rate type equations or anything else like that is in your transition. And that uh, tells how much and how fast, uh, whatever that, that uh, token is gonna flow from one place to another. So it's uh, relatively straightforward. All of our um, equations now can be put into those transitions and those places are gonna determine the, the mass or, or the concentration that's moving throughout the model. Um, so this is an example of a uh, PBTK model that I made in PetriNet. You can see the same types of tissues and places. We have uh, gill flux at the top. So that's our, our, um, our exposure. And then uh, we have our chemical moving to the right over to the arterial blood. And then they're moving uh, left from there. So uh, it's governed into each of those tissues by these transitions here. And then uh, it, uh, the, the, the uh, compound then continues to move back into the venous blood uh, using these transitions. And so we've got those individual equations there. Um, I'm showing this in Snoopy, which is a software that's used to simulate, to design, uh, create, simulate, and distribute PBTK models. So this is just a uh, Snoopy file. Now I can send it to anybody else. If you have Snoopy, which is an open source software, you can go ahead and play and simulate this model. Um, so to validate that or evaluate that this model uh, is doing the same thing as an ODE model, I took an existing uh, ODE PBTK model um, that uh, Carrie Smith wrote in her thesis uh, of fluoranthine uh, waterborne fluoranthine exposure in rainbow trout. Uh, in order to uh, create this uh, petri net type model, I had to introduce a blood volume parameter, which is essentially converting, uh, helping me to convert from mass to concentration in certain, in, in, uh, in the blood. Um, so in the arterial blood and the volume blood, if you have a mass of, of uh, fluoranthine or a mass of compound moving through, you need to be able to uh, change that to concentration. Other than that, uh, I was able to use all the same parameters uh, in, in the Smith model. And uh, so in comparing my uh, simulation results to uh, Smith's simulation results, I used some uh, uh, equations here to, to compare the goodness of fit and so forth. And I did a sensitivity analysis on that blood volume parameter, showing that it was uh, actually a very robust parameter. It's not very sensitive. Uh, even by an order of magnitude, it didn't change the results very much. Um, so here I'm showing you some of the results. Uh, the output of a PBTK model is going to be a time course uh, concentration prediction in various tissues. So here I have uh, the brain tissue. I've got time on this axis and uh, the fluoranthine concentration on this axis. So at time zero, you have no fluoranthine. Um, after a few days, uh, you get uh, 
fluorantine in the brain. These point, these blue points here uh, with errors are Smith's experimental results. So we're trying to match uh, what her experimental results were. And there's actually two curves here. There's a gray one and an orange one, and they're basically sitting right on top of each other. So orange is Smith's model and gray is the new PetriNet model. And essentially they're exactly the same. Um, on the right there, we have uh, the fluoranthine con concentration in different tissue. That's in poorly perfused tissue or muscle, essentially. And uh, we're also overlapping the two, um, two lines. I guess I just showed one there, but they're pretty much sitting on top of each other. And what I wanted to point out here is, although the two models matched each other fairly well, we're not exactly uh, following the, um, the uh, experimental results. And uh, so the models predict uh, too much fluoranthine concentration at the early time points. At steady state, it's okay, but at those early time points, we're, we're looking at too rapid uh, of an increase in fluoranthine concentration. So uh, as far as my initial objective, though, to make a petri net model that simulated the, the same as the OD model, I did that, but we didn't really like those uh, results in the PPT. So for my second objective, uh, I wanted to use some statistical optimization tools uh, to improve the model fit. So how can we uh, statistically improve that model fit? Um, and so what we're really looking to do is minimize the difference between our model simulation results and our experimental results. And to do this, I created a tool in Python um, it, on the top are the various tabs. So we start with defining uh, the various parameters. Some of those parameters we'll want to keep steady, the ones that we know um, we're, we're fairly confident in, but other parameters we might want to, uh, we might want to optimize. And uh, you can put various strengths, minimum, maximum, even some equations on how, how those parameters can be optimized. Um, in the second, mo uh, second tab, model definition, so I import that uh, PetriNet PBTK model out of Snoopy, um, and, and that's my model file then. And in the third tab, I import some evaluation results, and so that's how I can compare, uh, compare my simulated versus the evaluation results. And this is the final tab in which I'm doing the actual optimization, and I've got a drop down for several different optimization methods, least squares, and there's some Markov chain Mar Monte Carlo and, and variety of other methods used to hone in on, on that multi-parameter uh, optimization. And uh, then as the results, we get uh, some optimized parameters, as well as some AIC and some other statistical information to tell us how good our optimization was. And so I, I did a couple of case studies here to, uh, to, to see how this uh, optimizer works. The first, uh, uh, first study I did was trying to optimize various kinetic parameters. So on the left, uh, in the, our original model, we had both, both first order and Michaelis-Menten uh, kinetics. So I tested some other models that had only Michaelis-Menten or only uh, first order kinetics and tried to optimize those kinetic parameters to see how that affected the mo uh, model results and found out that uh, first order kinetics uh, did a pretty good job of, um, of simulating or, or just as good of a job as simulating as Michaelis meant. And first order kinetics are a lot simpler and there's uh, less parameters to parameterize the model. So if we can get away with using that, it's a good thing to do. Um, and then just some uh, mathematical equations to show that that, true, that holds true that uh, at low substrate concentration that first order kinetics uh, does a pretty good job of simulating the Kalis menten um, So the second case study is I wanted to optimize that blood volume parameter that uh, I had created uh, for the petri net in the first place. Um, so I had said I did a sensitivity analysis on that blood volume parameter where I started at roughly 3% of the body weight and uh, went an order of magnitude smaller or larger to see what the sensitivity was. But here I wanted to actually optimize that parameter to the data to see if I could fit the data any better. And uh, to be honest, I, I really can. Um, so this, uh, this line here is an optimized um, uh, blood volume and I can 
uh, predict the, uh, the, the concentration over time pretty well in the various tissues. Uh, but when I do that, I get a blood volume parameter that's uh, not really physiologically relevant. It's uh, three, four times the size of the fish. So it's like, what, what, you know, what good does that do for us? Um, so I thought, well, perhaps maybe this could be some surrogate quasi parameter type thing that maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's accounting for some diffusion limitations or something else. We can try to try to explain how we could justify using a ridiculous number for the blood volume to, to better uh, suit our model. And uh, to, to help justify this, I, I thought, uh, did we lose that? Oh, there we go. Um, to help justify this, I figured if we could show that uh, this blood volume parameter maybe has some, uh, some trend with, with uh, KOW or something like that for other PAHs, and maybe we're on to something here. And so to, to help with the justification, I found uh, Chris Kennedy's work on, on his thesis, on his dissertation, where he uh, made some toxicokinetic models for some other PAHs, uh, fluorine, pyrene, et cetera. I converted those toxicokinetic models into a PBTK model, and uh, rather simple one uh, model with only first order metabolism and uh, just a few compartments. And then when I take these PBTK model and I uh, simulate them according to Kennedy's experimental exposures, I can, uh, I can find uh, some trends that, that look pretty good and, and kind of match his exposure. And when I did this in my initial results, I found uh, some, um, that uh, this is using a, a really high blood volume parameter in order to get that. So I thought, well, maybe maybe we're actually onto something here. Um, however, I I'm, I'm doing a lot of optimization for these uh, for these initial models, and I wanted to kind of refine these these uh, these results to make sure that that uh, I'm really seeing this effect. And so also in in Kennedy's work. He, um, he put his fish in these little chambers, and uh, when he did that, he was able to e evaluate how much uh, of these PAHs are coming out through different, uh, different routes and, and basically the timing of excretion. So he could uh, look at how much uh, PAH is coming out uh, in the, through the gills, which was, which was very low, uh, through the kidneys or um, through the uh, through the bile, and um, and he did that over the course of the exposure. Um, uh, uh, by the way, the exposure that he was using was a intraarterial exposure. So rather than a waterborne exposure, he was just injecting the fish directly into the arteries with these PAHs. So slightly different type of exposure, but uh, but he was able to kind of get this whole picture of of what's happening and where. And um, the great thing about this is now I could optimize my model uh, using some more, uh, more evaluation results and, and uh, optimize these kinetic parameters and, and uh, different parameters to see exactly where, um, where things are happening. And when I did that, uh, now we're still uh, <coughs> optimizing the, um, the blood volume parameter as well. And, uh, and I, I get these solid lines now. The dotted lines were those initial results that I showed you. And, and you see that the, the lines, especially down here, look quite a bit different than those initial simulations. Um, so what we're seeing here is an initial spike in, in PAHs um, uh, in the richly perfused tissue, the poorly perfused tissue, and the liver tissue, not quite so much in fat. It takes a, a little while longer to get into the fat tissues. Um, but you're seeing that initial spike, which is going to be a result of that intra-arterial exposure, uh, followed by this gradual decrease in levels of, of those tissues. And even though these, these, uh, these trends are quite a bit different than those initial uh, uh, results that I had found, um, they still match the evaluation data pretty well. So 
uh, both of those lines can, can really uh, match, but I'm a little more confident in these lines because we have the full scenario. Um, so uh, summarizing, uh, increased uh, confidence in, in, these, in these refined model results, that uh, additional excretion data uh, really helps uh, to, to refine things. And, uh, and the, our K values made sense when we, when we looked at uh, other in vitro experiments. And finally, the optimized V blood parameter that was used in those second, uh, second uh, models uh, was looking around 2% of the body weight, which is now physiologically relevant. So, um, so a few lessons learned and conclusions here. Um, but uh, so we've got we've got uh, we've got good data. I guess this is kind of my learning here. You can do these optimizations, but you kind of really have to have to uh, use them with care because you can kind of get sidetracked and go down the go down the wrong route uh, with, with with some uh, maybe misleading information. And uh, and finally, we still don't really know what's happening with that initial um, waterborne model, um, but yeah, I decided to quit pursuing that and uh, go on to objective three, which is essentially why uh, I'm here these past couple of weeks. Um, we're looking to integrate <coughs> PBTK modeling with these AOP modeling um, to link adverse outcomes to the internal concentrations rather than uh, water concentrations or whole body concentrations and possibly predict adverse outcomes from different exposures. And uh, so Homer's math there, I, I kind of looked over it quickly and it seems to make sense in this. <laughs> um, so uh, to, to create this PBTK AOP model, we're looking at antidepressants. Um, antidepressants are highly prescribed and they're in the environment. And uh, so the particular types of antidepressants I'm looking at are SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And so they block the reuptake pathways of, uh, of serotonin. And, um, and we know that uh, uh, these same pathways work in fish and, and humans. And why I chose this is because some of my uh, lab mates or previous lab mates uh, have done a lot of work with, with fish antidepressant exposures. And of course, I have a lot of data to help me make these models. Um, but what, uh, what they're working at is SSRI um, exposures and, uh, and their endpoint that they're looking at is the time to capture prey. So if you, if you expose a hybrid striped bass to uh, antidepressants in the water, uh, how will that affect their time to eat uh, fathead minnows? Um, and the, the idea being that if their appetite is suppressed, it'll take them longer to eat those minnows. And uh, so this is from uh, Lauren Sweet's dissertation, but as are uh, Ben Lefaxin is one of the SSRIs, as the concentration increases, the time to capture the prey uh, also increases. So we have two lines. This is the first fish, uh, time to capture the first minnow, and then the time to capture the second minnow. So uh, looks like the time to capture the first minnow, they're still eating that fairly rapidly, but maybe um, when they have higher levels of SSRIs, they're not as hungry and it takes them much longer to get that second minnow. So again, we start out with a uh, Petri net uh, PBTK model, um, a pretty similar type thing. So we've got our, uh, we're inspiring or bringing in our SSRI through the gills into the arterial blood, gets distributed into the various tissues. Uh, we have some biotransformation happening here in the liver. Um, goes out back into the venous blood and some of it goes back out through the gills and uh, that's recirculated throughout the system. Um, so what we've been working on is, is these adverse outcome pathways, which uh, uh, in general, a, uh, the AOP, you begin with a stressor that has some sort of molecular uh, response or molecular in, uh, initiating event those responses go up uh, to a cellular or a, or a whole organism level. 
and you have some type of adverse outcome. Um, in our case, uh, the adverse outcome might be a growth inhibition because they're capturing less prey. You could also have mortality or reproductive issues, um, uh, aggression, a, a variety of other um, type of behavior changes uh, that result in an adverse outcome and, and possibly a, a population effect. So how do, uh, SSRI, uh, how do SSRIs work? Uh, like I mentioned, an SSRI is going to bind to the serotonin uh, uh, transporter or uh, the CERT or SLC6A4. Um, the, uh, this inhibition leads to uh, more extracellular serotonin. It's the 5-HT serotonin, so you've got more in here and you've got less in here. Um, also, since you have less serotonin up here, uh, this is metabolism, so you have less of uh, serotonin's uh, metabolites in the, in the presynapse pre here. But anyway, so you've got, you've got a greater concentration of serotonin in this area. Serotonin is going to bind to some serotonin receptors and initiate some type of um, response. Um, uh, that uh, that results in some behavioral uh, changes here. So really we're just, we're looking at two different views of the same thing. You'll, you'll see uh, a lot of the same uh, actions here with the serotonin being released and uh, here's the real state. So that's inhibited. Um, and then a lot of downstream uh, responses that uh, quite a few pathways and stuff that can be affected. So over the past uh, uh, few days, uh, Knut and I have been working on some possible AOPs. Um, starting from the bo bottom, this, uh, this AOP was actually published for SSRIs, where you have the inhibition of CERT that leads to the increased uh, extracellular serotonin. Um, you have the stimulation of the receptors and an increase to time uh, to capture prey. Now, McDonald, um, uh, thought that the adverse outcome here might be impaired reproduction. So slightly different, we're, we're assuming that maybe there's a growth inhibition or, or some type of uh, decreased body weight in our, in our adverse outcomes. But essentially we start with the same thing um, and, and we, we just go a little bit farther in depth. So we've got the inhibition of CERT and uh, increased extracellular serotonin. Uh, you've got the brain receptor activities. Then you've got a, a bunch of uh, signal cascades here with uh, BDNF, uh, TERC B binding, and, and that's kind of a, a signal cascade that we, we propose might, uh, might be the cause of the, the suppressed uh, appetite. And uh, this is maybe an, our, our, um, an alternative route of, of some other key events that are, that are leading to that uh, adverse outcome. So again, I'm trying to put that, uh, that model, that AOP model into a Petri net. And, uh, and this is uh, fairly new, so I don't have any uh, results here yet. But uh, you've got the same, uh, the same type of action here. So you've got the brain uh, antidepressant or the an antidepressant concentration in the brain that's gonna bind and inhibit your uh, serotonin reuptake trans uh, transporter. So this, mechanism here, that pathway is stopped uh, after that inhibition, and you've got an increased uh, synaptic serotonin. Um, there's some other stuff going around up there that, uh, that may result in, in more chronic effects, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some other types of pathways. But really, we're looking here at, okay, so what happens after you have this uh, synaptic serotonin? You're going to increase uh, binding of the the receptor, so serotonin receptor one or two, and then you have that signal cascade coming down here that results in an appetite inhibition and reduced body weight or growth inhibition. Um, you'll see that I have some circles that look like this and some circles that look like this. This is a what's called a continuous place, so that's giving me an actual concentration type value or, or some type of actual value, whereas this is a discrete place. Uh, so this is more for, um, uh, if, if we don't know an actual value, this is, this is more of a, 
a place that's just telling me maybe a possibility that something may occur. Um, also, uh, similarly with, with, these, uh, with these filled squares, this is a transition that isn't going to give me a precise rate, but it might be a stochastic type transition or a, a transition that's going to be more, um, more time delay or an immediate transition rather than quantifying it. So this, is, this part here is more giving me maybe a probability of, of something happening, whereas this is giving me exact concentrations. And to be honest, this is pretty fresh, so I don't know exactly which part are going to be continuous and which part is going to be more stochastic or discrete. Uh, but at some point, maybe we'll be able to predict whether something will happen, maybe not the extent or the, be able to quantify what, uh, what happens. But as we get more data on these, on these intermediate steps, then we can quantify more of that going along and, and leaving less in, in discrete data. And again, the same thing, now we're taking the AOP and we're uh, combining that with the PBTK. So the AOP, uh, sorry, the PBTK is giving us brain concentration of the antidepressant. And then we've got the binding to CERT and that's how we link the two of these models together. <clears throat> And also, so the risk assessment database. So now that we've got a proposed um, AOP, we can take, uh, we can get some data from the risk assessment da database to try to quantify some of that, as well as uh, we have to input some data from some of our other experiments. Uh, so um, we're kind of going back and forth uh, with the RADB in order to uh, both provide and, and get more information from it and uh, the RADB is, is getting a lot of its data from uh, uh, several different sources down here. So uh, there's a, a whole lot of data in the RADB, and so we're, we're able to access some of that as well as provide some new data. Um, so out of the RADB, um, you know, we can, we can uh, hopefully help with our quantitative AOP development, which is what we're working on here, uh, as well as our weight of evidence. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of other uh, potential options, uh, potential uh, uses for the for the RADB. And uh, so once we're done with that, um, this this is just kind of opening the door for a lot of different uh, exposure models, different antidepressant classes uh, to see how uh, MAOIs and other types of uh, antidepressants can can mix with SSRIs and and possible outcomes of that, um, as well as different adverse outcomes. So right here we're proposing. Uh, to use that time to capture prey that, that uh, inhibits growth, but what about aggression, motility, uh, reproduction, et cetera. Um, using petri net tools, um, it's, that's a, um, there, it's a whole field around petri nets and, and how, to, how to model these. So we're using fuzzy modeling and a bunch of these other newer uh, petri net approaches to, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to help us uh, expand our models and, and get more data. Out of, out of different types of models. And uh, uh, also we'd, we'd like to be able to um, not only get information out of the RADB, but uh, hopefully use some PBTK models uh, to, to help input data into the uh, RADB, such as tissue concentrations and being able to uh, help predict those internal tissue concentrations um, from, from external water concentrations. <laughs> Um, so other than that, I've got a lot of other side projects. I like to get out in the field once in a while, and we, uh, we have a problem with invasive uh, lionfish in the Caribbean and in, in, uh, in the United States, so we do uh, as much work as we can shooting those and uh, collecting biomarkers and so forth. And uh, thank you to everybody here at NEVA who's helped uh, and, uh, and created the database and, and some people from uh, the USGS and EPA who have helped, as well as uh, committee members and others at, at Clemson and other people who've helped provide uh, data for the different models. And with that, I'll take some questions. Do you compile that 
Um, so how it is, it's actually, I believe the file structure, I think they're saved as XML type files, um, but you you open, you can open them and export uh, your, your Snoopy Petri nets to a, a variety of different languages. So you can actually export uh, a Petri net to, a, uh, to an ODE or to SVML or, or to uh, MATLAB code, I believe. So there, there's a variety of different ways to, to export that. Well, uh, thanks for an interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. I never about the uh, Petri Net uh, mm -hmm. before, uh, but um, maybe I think that Eric has mentioned already here. We, I think we have worked a little on Bayesian networks uh, mm -hmm. um, as an effort to quantify or make quantitative AOP. Yep. And at, at first glance, it looked a bit similar. It, but, it, but it, I understand it is very similar. In fact, Bayesian networks <laughs> have been uh, modeled in, in uh, discrete Petri Nets. But what the Petri net offers is also then the combination of the continuous modeling with, with more of the discrete modeling and, and more of a hybrid approach to, to, uh, to, to help. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what I wondered. Uh, also, if, if the nodes were actually distributions or more single numbers uh, in the Petri net. So they can be they can be both. So with okay. the, with the fuzzy modeling, that's when you can have a an actual number with the distribution around it. So it's kind of a that's why they call it a fuzzy number. Um, so you don't know the exact uh, number, and then you and then the you're able to simulate uh, more of a dis, uh, distribution. Then. Okay. Then they seem to have more in common than I mm -hmm. thought. Yep. After yep. All. Yeah. Yep. So um, uh, I'm sure you would hear more about. Uh, or reports if you're, uh, or you can if you're mm -hmm. interested in it, it could be interesting to maybe try both approaches to the same uh, cases. Yep. Compare them and yeah. Both, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I also had a question about the metric net. Like, what's the difference between discrete and continuous here? Because the differential equations that you are converting to metric nets, they don't have solutions. Like, you've got to simulate them. So, right. is it discrete anyway? Um, What's the difference there? So the discrete, it doesn't give you an actual quantity in that place. So the continuous gives you gives you an actual uh, a number, a, a digital, you know, a floating point number or whatever. Um, whereas the discrete is is more of just uh, if if it's activated or not activated. So it's more of a binary type place. Whereas the continuous is. Um, you, you can you can assign a value to it. So does that make sense? It's like so we solve all the other equations numerically. I always discretize them, but uh, the discretization you can uh, the time step can like, vary by so that you get in order to minimize the error. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to specify that the time step like in the, in the discrete. So. So the discrete is like activated or not activated per time step. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So Colleen, thanks for my great talk. Um, from a sort of an application perspective, mm -hmm. um, we know that, for instance, chemical dosing is not constant to the but mm -hmm. they are essentially a thematic process. Um, if there's a, a need for, or there's a potential here to make use of that for, let's call that higher resolution models of, of the actual exposures, mm -hmm. and whether you are actually proving beyond a certain point of, of a threshold for safety purposes. Uh, but in, in your case, hybrid strike balance for us is, uh, is, is uh, not the species we are mm -hmm. used to. How well does your model uh, then be able to uh, uh, transfer to other fish species? We're talking about other the the behavior. Right, so the, the PBTK model is, is fairly good for extrapolation, better than a standard toxicokinetic because of the physiological basis of the parameters that you're using. So by, by knowing one species to uh, another and those differences, now I can parameterize it for uh, the striped bass and evaluate that model and now switch the parameters to say a rainbow trout. and, and uh, and, and then that should uh, should reflect that that difference. So, um, because a lot of those parameters are known and, and have uh, are are known between different species, it's it's pretty good at at doing that cross species extrapolation. And there's been a number of uh, papers. Uh, Brinkman, uh, I think, wrote the best one uh, relatively recently about that cross species extrapolation and how changing those 
parameters is, is pretty, uh, it's able to reflect that pretty well. Um, the, the major uh, difficulty there probably being the, uh, the, phy the phyto transformation parameters uh, between species is probably the most difficult one to, to make a change. So, but you'd have been successful if where we know most would be the most accurate model, but you still can do some extrapolation. Yep. Um, I don't know. The only here is, is working on a bit of from offshore power production or an oil field emissions, mm. typically those type of variable dosing. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. The solution is that it would be widely relevant to that, but that would be within species which are, well, maybe not that far. Yeah. Permacrized in terms of, of some of these uh, things you need. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's. If you catch a few of them, you can you can always, uh, you know, the tissue volumes are, are pretty easy to parameterize and stuff. And yeah, I, I don't, I guess the, the biotransformation would be, would be difficult, but yeah. Especially with, with PAHs, uh, biotransformation is very important. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation.